Hi, I'm Tom at Ledgemere, and today I'm going to talk about something that's very near and dear to my heart, and that's electric fencing. So I decided to put together a short video and tell you everything I know about electric fencing. Stick around, and let's get this fence energized. First thing you want to do is you want to find a good site for your charger. And you want to anchor it to the wall properly. You don't just want it hanging by wires. It's also important to buy a good charger. There's three different types of chargers that you can buy. There's AC powered, battery powered, and solar. There's applications that are ideal for all of those. I usually like to go with the AC powered ones because I can pretty much set it and forget it. With the battery powered ones, you either have to have a solar charger on it or you have to come charge them back up. They also make a really good solar charger you just have to be cognizant of the fact that it does have a battery in it and so you'll have to periodically check it to make sure that it's still putting out the voltage necessary to provide a shock so how does the electric fence work what it is is stored energy in the charger and it periodically pulses it out along a wire for your electric fence and that potential energy becomes kinetic energy when something touches that wire and makes a path to ground I've got a few do's and don'ts I'm going to put up on the next screen and I hope that you'll pay close attention to those because some of those are very important not only for your safety but for your animals and wildlife safety as well. The fence chargers have two terminals or two posts on them. One is going to be your fence terminal. This is the terminal that you attach your electric fence wire to. So generally for that I like to use a, a, a braided wire and it's, it's important that you use a wire that's made for electric fences. You don't want to just go down to the hardware store and buy some automotive wire. That's, that's not going to work out so well. The jacket is specifically designed and a braided wire is preferred but not necessary. When you use a braided wire that you, when you strip it back, that you're not breaking off some of the strands because you lose conductivity. So I just give it a couple wraps here. You can make it a little bit prettier. You could put terminals on it. There's all kinds of different things you can do to make it, make it pretty, but this is one of those things where prettier isn't always better. The same also holds true to your ground. This ground cable is a single conductor, but it's galvanized which is very important. You don't want rust. Rust will really inhibit the conductive conductivity of the, of the electric of the wire. And the next thing is to install a surge protector. And while it's not required, it's certainly a good idea. So what you're seeing right now, this is in kilovolts. So 5,300, 5,700 kilovolts. And every time you hear a pop, it's an impulse going out on the line. So you can see here, long-haired livestock would obviously be cattle and short-haired would be horses. This defense system is primarily designed for cattle and horses, although it can be adapted for sheep and goats. Now the most important, if not the singularly most important aspect of your electric fence is your grounding system. Your ground is going to be determined by the soil and the amount of ground posts you have in it and also the time of year. If you have really sandy, rocky soil, you may need more than one ground post. And so right here, I've actually got my ground connected to the post 
and connected to the sheep wire here, the cattle wire, which is also connected to all the steel posts on the line. It's very important, and this is where I'm telling you what one of the most important things about your grounding system is, is that you need to test it periodically, and you don't want to use a regular voltmeter because you'll blow it up. You need to have a device like this. And these are not cheap, but these are your lifesaver. And so all you have to do is you put your thumb on the ground post, and then you put it here. And so what this is showing me is that I really don't have any voltage going to ground. So that's good. If you see voltage on this, it means your ground is bad. I saw one video on YouTube the other day where this guy had grounded his electric fence to his home, his, his AC panel, and that is probably one of the most dangerous things you can do. The reason behind that is now you've got this giant lightning rod out in your field. And what happens if lightning strikes that and it goes back to your ground at your house? Well, you probably just blew up your whole electrical panel, maybe burn down your house. Grounding it to a water pipe, a lot of the old timers would ground their uh, AC panel to a water pipe in the house. And that was back in the days when everything was copper and it still didn't really make a good ground because that, that AC is going to try to find a path to ground really quick. and. It, it could be you, it could be your walls, it could be a piece of appliances, a piece of furniture. Very, very dangerous. So a, a grounding system is your most important, if not the singularly most important part of your electric fence. Let's take a few minutes and talk about some of your electric fence components. There's been a lot of studies conducted and what they've come back with is that this poly rope right here with the, with the black and white barber pole on it is one of the most visible fences for animals and humans. They've tried orange, they've tried yellow, and they've just determined that black and white with the barber pole on it is most visible. And you can see I've got white here, and there is some black in it, but it's not as, as vivid as this. I got this from Premier One, and they, they make some pretty good electrical uh, electric fencing products, although I'm not particularly a fan of their chargers but their, their other stuff is pretty good. You got different types of, of line posts. These right here are for, for tape, and I didn't buy these. These were kind of here with the farm. And the, the tape is, is a wider, like a ribbon. And I've, I've got mixed ideas about that. It's, it's visible, sure, but it, it just uh, flaps in the wind, and it seems to be a sail. You've got ceramic conductors, and I sometimes like these on corners or if I have to go over the top of a post and say I've got a short wooden post, these kind of work pretty well. Now, remember an electric fence is a psychological barrier, meaning that the animals know that that fence is hot and they know if they put their nose on it, it's gonna hurt. So they psychologically avoid it. It's not gonna do much to stop them physically if the fence is out and believe me, as soon as the fence is off, they know. They'll, they'll plow right through it and then you've got to whole bunch of posts pulled out and you've got wire everywhere and cows down the road. We always had an electric fence when I was a kid and what we did was we'd combine a permanent fence with an electric fence, meaning that we usually ran like three strands of barbed wire with a strand of electric on it. And the reason behind that was as the season progresses and the grass is always green on the other side of the fence, the animals would kind of push on the barbed wire a little bit and knock the fences over after a while. With a, with a hot wire on it, they just psychologically know to stay away from it, and the physical barrier of the fence mostly will keep them in. Poly rope comes in some different size thicknesses. This is quarter, I've got three eighths, and the smaller stuff is good if you're combining it with a physical fence because they can still see it, but it's not the only means of, of uh, containment. You've also got poly wire, which I absolutely avoid it. I hate it, it's always tangled up, and it, it is so tiny. It doesn't really conduct electricity so well because it's only got a couple little hairs of, of uh, microscopic wire in it. So you find that over the long haul, the resistance... The sm okay, let me, let me give you a short electrical lesson here. The smaller the pipe, the more pressure that is going through it. And that's great for water, but you don't get the volume. So when, you, when you're talking about electric fences, your current is your pressure and the, the voltage is the volume. So when you start seeing a high current that means it's inversely related to the voltage so the high current means it's trying to, to push but the voltage is going to be low 
and generally that's because you have a high resistance. The simplest way to talk about an electric fence is you have a garden hose plugged into your house and you got a bunch of bunch of sections of garden hose and every time you plug one together you've got a little leak because you have a bad washer so you're going to lose a little bit of volume all the way and so you've got the same amount of pressure the same amount of volume starting at point a but by the time it gets to point b you're very low in volume because you've you've leaked it all out over the place so electric fences are similar to that and you can have all kinds of things that'll inhibit your electric fence charge. Primarily, it's gonna be like a tree limb or a bush that's grown onto it, you know, a tree limb that's fallen down, or most probably, it's gonna be tall grass. Generally speaking, the animals will eat up close to the fence, but they won't touch it. So you've got poly tape or poly ribbon, which is the wide ribbon, but like I said, it really catches and flaps in the wind, and I don't, I don't really like it at all. It's expensive also. The poly rope is, is my favorite combined with a permanent fence. Some people will use steel wire and that's great with a permanent fence also. In fact, that's what we always had was just the, the three strands of barbed wire and one strand of steel wire that ran through it. And that works great, but it's not very visible. So unless you're putting tags or, or some sign or something all along the run, it's, it's dangerous to, to persons. And in some states, it's actually legal to not have that marked. The animals can't see it either. So I, when I was little, I actually, I had a horse and I'd been gone a few days and when I came back, he was so happy to see me, he didn't even see the fence and he, he plowed right through it on the way back to see me. What some folks do is they'll build a big square with a permanent fence and then they'll temporary fence little paddocks in the middle. I see people with a poorly con constructed fence and especially along busy highways. I'm, I'm told that in Nevada, if you hit somebody's cow, you are liable and need to pay the farmer the cost of the cow and you are also responsible for your own damages. However, in Maine, that's not, that's not the case. If, if you are a farmer in Maine and you have cattle that get out and get run down, you're liable for the damages to the, to the motorist and liable for lawsuit. And as Joel Salatin has says, you don't even know the meaning or you don't even know what you're into until someone sues you. So I'm, I'm really always afraid of being sued. We live in a litigious, society where people are always looking to sue somebody and, and get rich. So I really can't overemphasize enough the importance of a strongly conducted fence and a fence that is only a psychological barrier is a little, is a little iffy. And I, I do have a couple here, but they're, they're like day paddocks and I only put the animals out when I'm right there and I can keep an eye on them. And there's always tons of feed there so they don't have a reason to get out but I don't leave them there overnight and certainly not if I'm not present. You know, people will joke, I got the best pasture around so the animals will get out, but they'll come back. Well, that's probably true, but if someone hits them in the interim, then it's not gonna be a good day for you or them. So poly rope, poly wire, poly tape, and steel wire are your primary conductors for electric fence. What you never ever, ever wanna do is use barbed wire. And the reason behind it is if the animal gets snagged on it or if a person gets snagged on it, now they can't escape. And so they're getting hit with that electric current and that, that can kill them. I mean, the electric fence won't kill you or kill the animals if you just touch it because you impulsively will snap back. You don't, your, you know, your reaction is to jump away and that's the same with the animals. But if you're stuck to it, now you're just gonna take the electric shock going to ground and you're probably, mm, your chances of surviving that are not very good. So I, I've seen it before and I just cringe at the thought of anybody using barbed wire for electric fence. So there's lots of different types of insulators. I just showed you the one for poly tape and this one right here is a, a gate hook. It would have a, another part that's missing. It would go on a T post and then you connect your gates to it. Insulator and these go on the fiberglass posts and those are pretty good for like, you know, a, a short span to break up a paddock, but they're, they're really not that great for a long, a long fence line. This is a T post insulator and one of the kinds of insulators that I'm trying out is basically this one with this on the back. So it has the, the standoff like this to keep it away from the electric, uh, to keep it away from the T post, but it has this on the back. So it's more of a positive attachment. I really haven't had too many troubles with these breaking off. They, it does happen from time to time. And you can see this one's broken right there. So that's generally where it breaks. Although sometimes this tab will break off here. This is a corner post. 
or a corner insulator for a T-post. Another corner one, you see it's insulated, you got holes, different places, you can, different ways to attach that. This is a screw on one into a wooden post. And these are two different types of nail on insulators. There's also, oh, there's, there's this type too. And I don't use that too terribly much because these don't really work well for poly rope. These work great for, for poly wire and they work great for steel wire, but they don't work for anything else. And they're really cheap uh, and the nails tend to pull through. When I use them, I use two story nails. Some people call them foundation nails because they have two heads. So they'll drive these into a board to the first story and then you hit it the second story out so that you can still pull it back out. So these are, these are worth buying if you're running anything smaller than poly rope. Also, generally speaking, I use steel posts. I have a few cedar posts, but I've found that these are actually cheaper and they'll last longer. These right here can get loose and pop out a lot more readily than these will because they've got the anchor on it and they're easier to drive in, especially up here in Maine where the ground is so rocky. I can, I can auger in or, or pound them in, fence post pounder. Gate wheels are always a plus. It makes the, the long gates a lot easier to open and close. As kind of a, a test last year, an experiment, I bought one of these these lights here, and I'm not sure what's happened to it. It was working the other day, and now it's not. You can see I still have 35, 3600, 3700 kilovolts on that. So let's say you've checked your line, and you don't have the voltage that you want, or you have no voltage at all. The first thing you want to go do is go make sure that the breaker to your fence charger is not tripped. Make sure it's plugged in. All the basics. And I know this sounds dumb, but I've done it a thousand times. That's the only reason I'm mentioning it. Here I've got a surge protector for lightning strikes. Make sure that's not tripped. This one has a fuse in it. Make sure that's not blown. And then the next thing you'll do is you'll unhook it from the line side you'll take a voltage reading there. If that tests good, go to your fence and find the last good reading. If you've got several paddocks tied together, unhook all of them and then slowly put one back. So you got one at a time coming back into the circuit and then that should help you determine which one is bad. You'll probably have to walk your entire fence line. I always do what they call the half split method. So if I've got a shut off, I'll go shut that off and then check the first half if that's good. Then I'll go plug it back in and start working on the second half. I had a problem this morning and it wasn't grass, it wasn't branches, but what had happened, it's really windy today. So it had spun the barbed wire and the electric wire together. And you run this tight, but it stretches inherently, it will stretch. So that's what happened. I had a little bit of a sag in the electric wire and it grounded out to the barbed wire and no voltage but now I've, I've rectified that and everything is, is uh, copacetic again.